begin on page one. As you know, we have a collect uh, that we pray uh, every uh, live month that kind of roots us in our theme. And this year, this class is obviously Eastertide. We're talking about the theology of Easter Day. Uh, so this is the third collect. There are three collects for Easter um, itself. This is the third collect, which I think is pretty rich. So let's pray this one together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to kind of unpack Easter. Uh, did you want to go with the kids now, or you want to wait? Yeah, 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 let's do, yeah. So teenagers who want to go with Father Matt to do your own kind of Bible study on the readings for Easter Sunday morning, feel free to kind of head on in. You're going to the conference room, I think. And if you haven't got notes for the class, they are on the narthex table over there. But let's start with this quote from my good buddy, Pius Parsh. Uh, one of my great favorite liturgical theologians. We have scaled the mountain, and the victory is ours. The goal toward which we strove during 40 anxious days, the goal already outlined for us at the beginning of Advent, has finally been achieved. Light now triumphs over darkness, and a divine sun beams its warm, clear light into the kingdom of God's elect. Through Advent, as in a night, we yearn for the light. At Christmas, the light came suddenly into the world, pierced the darkness with its rays, and illumined God's holy city by its glory. This was a glad message of the Christmas season. But even in the midst of Christmas joy, a discordant strain was heard, one that grew continually louder and louder. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness grasped it not. Already during the octave of Christmas, we heard the cry of suffering, a cry that has never since been absent. With the first Sunday of Lent, the divine David entered the arena to do battle with the giant Goliath. The whole Lenten season may well be regarded as a battle, the battle of light against darkness. True, the light was crushed out temporarily as Jesus died on Calvary. But just as its beams unexpectedly pierced the gloom on Christmas night, so now after the tribulations of Holy Week, the Easter sun rises to shine forever. I'm glad it's kind of bouncing around this room tonight, which is pretty cool. Our church, by the way, acts like a, like a sundial. I know when Easter is coming near because there will be a beam of light that goes right over on that fourth station and hits Jesus and Mary. And then... As we get to Easter, it always hits the baptismal font, which is really kind of cool, as it does tonight. But I'm, I love to see this interplay of light that's happening, because that really is what's happening um, in the church right now that is filled with light. All the lights are at maximum capacity. Remember during Lent, they were down a little bit. Now they're at full, full glory. Well, let's talk about the bodily resurrection of Christ, which we are celebrating um, as I kind of mentioned on Easter Sunday, I think it was, I do a lot of classes on proofs of the resurrection, and I just keep adding to them and adding to them. Uh, because I, to me, the most provable facet of Christianity is the resurrection, which sounds bizarre. Uh, but when you look at all of the evidence that surrounds it, um, it's the only thing that points to that Christ rose from the dead, the tomb is empty, and many people's lives were changed and is being passed down from century to century to century down to us. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis about what I just kind of said, uh, which I think is really kind of interesting. I mean, we'll unpack it. I think since there's a smaller group tonight, we're going to unpack a lot together, so that'll be fun. The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole of history of the universe. And that is true. That event has only occurred once. It blew the mind of everyone in the first century because they were not expecting it. The Greeks and the Romans did not believe in a bodily resurrection because they actually didn't like the body. 
Um, you think of Plato. Plato hated the body. He thought the best thing you can do is get your soul out of your body because your body... So they weren't even expecting. The Greeks and Romans didn't even have it in their head, a bodily resurrection. In the first century Jewish world, they either thought you just died and nothing happened. That was the belief of the Sadducee party. Or they thought you went down to a place of shadows, kind of like the Greek and Roman Hades, called Sheol, where there were kind of levels, but it was still shadows. And then there was kind of a thought about 100 years prior to Jesus that at the end of time, there may be some resurrection, but we don't know if that'll be a bodily one. And it would only really happen to those who died in good relationship with the Lord, martyrs or stuff like that. So the fact that the New Testament writers talked about a physical bodily resurrection was completely unheard of in their time frame. As I kind of said during Easter Sunday sermon, it's like going to Leonardo da Vinci in the 1500s and saying, hey, pick up your phone and you're able to hit this button and you're going to see someone in Milan and they'll call it FaceTime. And I joked and he would say, what is a telephone? Right? So it was completely out of their mindset. That is the bodily resurrection. And so for the New Testament writers to write of it, it was a a once-in-a-lifetime event that changed human history. Christ is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. The resurrection and its consequences were the gospel. Now, pause there. You know, we always say gospel. When I, when I say to you, gospel, what do you think of? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You think of the written word, right? But remember the, the word that we say gospel in Greek is evangelion. is the proclamation of a king's decisive victory. And we nickname that good news because the king has done something victorious. So when you hear the word gospel, we immediately go to the page. Or we immediately go to just the four. But when the Christians say the gospel, they are talking about the triumph of the king, which is good news. The gospel or good news which the Christians brought, what we call the gospels, the narratives of our Lord's life and death, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were composed later for the benefit of those who had already accepted the gospel. The gospel, the written word, were in no sense the basis of Christianity. They were written for those who already were converted. The miracle of the resurrection and the theology of that miracle comes first. The biography comes later as a comment on it. Nothing could be more unhistorical than to pick out selected sayings of Christ from the Gospels and to regard those as the datum and the rest of the New Testament as construction upon it. The first fact in the history of Christendom is a number of people who say they have seen the resurrection. And when C.S. Lewis says they have seen the resurrection, it means they have seen the risen Lord. If they had died without making anyone else believe this evangelion, no physical gospels would ever have been written. Ooh, that's good. See, by the way, read anything you can of C.S. Lewis. You know, he is, he's a pretty amazing author and writer. Um, but this is really kind of powerful because I think we forget the fact that there was no written word... Paul is the first word that's recorded in his letter to the Corinthians, maybe, in the late 40s, early mid-40s. Christ rose in 33. So what were Christians doing from all of that time? Not just twitting their thumbs waiting for Jesus to FedEx the Gospels to them. They were already preaching. As you notice, Peter in Acts of the Apostles, which is the first reading on Easter Sunday, is out after Pentecost talking about how Christ rose from the dead. Why? Because all of these people had encounters with Jesus. And that relationship and encounters is what inspired thousands upon thousands, which is why you're sitting in this room today. Let's look at that letter from Paul, all right? So we also read this on Easter Sunday. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. Paul says to the church in Corinth, For I handed on to you as first importance, meaning this is the big deal, what I in turn had received. Pause, hard stop. When Paul says, I'm handing on to you, he got it from somewhere. It was handed on to him. By the way, we talk about tradition in the church. Tradition, which traditio means literally from the hand. Traditio. And we're not talking about traditions like wearing white or gold for Easter. Those are kind of just little traditions. This is the gospel preached by the apostles before anything was written down. It's the teaching of the church. So this was handed to Paul. And what does Paul say? He actually gives the first nuggets of the Apostles' Creed. By the way, that creed that we say at baptism, the creed that we say at morning prayer and evening prayer, we call the Apostles' Creed. Why? Because Paul gives us the basis for it already. Because he received it from who? Peter, James, John, the Apostles in Jerusalem that he met with, as well as his encounters with the risen Lord. So what's the crux of it? Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the crux of the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified, died, and was buried, descended, right? We still say that. But it was handed down to Paul. And then Paul says, you don't believe me? Here's a list of people who also saw him. He appeared to Cephas. By the way, that's Peter. Paul, being a good Jew, hysterically would never refer to Peter, which is Greek, by the way, Petros. That's where we get the word Peter from. The word Jesus would have used was Kephas, which is Aramaic, meaning rock. So does Petrus in Greek. But Paul never calls Peter by his Greek name, nickname. He calls him by his Aramaic name, Kephas. So he appears to Kephas. Then to the twelve. Then, and I love this line, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. We have no idea what that means. He just throws that out there because he expects the people of the church in Corinth to know some of those people. We don't know what that event was. We don't know where 500 people were gathered. But there were 500 people of disciples gathered and Jesus stood in their midst. And Paul even says, most of whom are still alive. A.K.A. they're probably sitting in your pew, Church of Corinth. So you don't believe me? Go ask them. Though some have died. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all of the apostles. And last of all, to someone untimely born, he also appeared to me. These are three different atheistic commentaries on this passage. The Oxford Companion to the Bible, which isn't necessarily fully atheist, but it's, it's a secular work, right? The earliest record of these appearances of the risen Lord is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 7. A tradition that Paul received after his apostolic call. Certainly not later than his visit to Jerusalem in 35. That's when Paul gets to Jerusalem to meet with the, the apostles in Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus rose from the dead in what year? 33. When he saw Cephas and James, who, like him, were recipients of appearances. Gerd Ludman. All New Testament atheistic professors are German, I swear. Gerd Ludman. The elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Not later than three the formation of the appearance traditions mentioned in 1 Corinthians falls into the time between 30 and 33. Robert Funk, non-Christian scholar, founder of the Jesus Seminar. The conviction, meaning the belief, that Jesus had risen from the dead had already taken root by the time Paul was converted about 33. On the assumption that Jesus died about 30. So some scholars think the dating's off by three years, by the way. That Jesus was really born in 3 BC. We think some of the dating is off, so whatever, between 30 and 33. The assumption that Jesus died in 30, the time for development was thus two or three years at the most. So going back to C.S. Lewis's comment, what changed those early believers? 
They all had experiences of the risen Savior, which completely transformed their lives. The greatest proof for the resurrection of Jesus, and there are many, in my opinion, is this ragtag group of Galilean sailors and fishermen who were mostly uneducated, except for a couple. Matthew was a tax collector, right? There may be some questions about Thomas as well, too. But for the most part, they were uneducated fishermen who were falling around this prophet from Galilee who dies, and at his death, they all go running and hiding because they thought they would die and they would be next. And these group of 12 come thundering out of that upper room on Pentecost Sunday and announce boldly that they, Christ was died, buried, and rose from the th grave on the third day, that they touched him, that they saw him, that they ate with him, and they were willing to die than to recount that they made about the lie. And not only did they not recount, not one of them said that they made it up, and every single one of them except for John died a brutal martyrdom, beheading, crucified, flayed alive, all kinds of things. And not one of them said, we never encountered this risen Lord. We made this all up. And it wasn't even in their mindset to make up. That's pretty awesome. Questions? Comments? Yeah. God bless. I have no idea. That's asking me to be your nutritionist and weight trainer. Right? <laughs> There must be good, she asked, she said, how can he be an atheist and a New Testament scholar? Some look at it from a secular historical point of view, um, but it doesn't make any sense. Like yes, 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 yes. And they make money. Yes. They sell books. So everything that we're celebrating, I mean, you're, by the way, my favorite part of the Easter liturgies, the Triduum, is the reading of St. John Chrysostom Paschal Sermon which I don't read, I shout until I lose my voice box, if you haven't watched it. And I'm telling you what, if you ever, I don't even know what comes over me, if you watch me before that starts, I'm like a bull in a bullpen rating to charge. Like I can't contain myself. It's like electricity is through me when I come and preach all this. Because this is life-changing stuff. And this is like Han Solo talking in that, the new Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens. It's all real. Oh, this is all real. This is all real. There are proofs. There is evidence. This has been going on for 2,000 years. This stuff is to change our lives and change the world. Like, this is the real deal. And that's why I shout to my voice drains. Uh, because this is what, this stuff has happened. And, and the whole point of looking at when this took root is another proof of the resurrection. When people say it was a lie, it was a myth. You cannot make up a lie or myth within a two-year span of the events. Why? The people who you're talking about are still alive. So if in a two-year time you make up a myth, first of all, there's no reason for them to make up a myth because they thought he was just done. They had no idea of anything of a bodily resurrection. But if none of that happened and they just decided to make this all up and say, Pontius Pilate killed him. Joseph of Arimathea buried him. Nicodemus buried him. People in the Sanhedrin who were actually out to get the Christians, it's another reason why it's bogus that they even made up their names, can easily come and say, what are you talking about? You want to come see the body? We just buried him. I know where he's located. He's in my tomb, for goodness sake. Come check him out. You Christians are making a... You can't make up a myth within a two-year time frame. Because the people are still alive. So all of these scholars dating the tradition almost two years after the resurrection are actually proving the resurrection and they're atheists. Which is fascinating. All right, as we kind of talk about the resurrection throughout these 50 days, let's look at the main elements of the framework that we're going to keep talking about over the 50 days. First and foremost is the empty tomb. The first element we encounter in all of the resurrection accounts is the empty tomb. By the way, if you notice in the resurrection accounts, there is not one description of the resurrection. When you look at all four Gospels, not one of those authors said, and all of a sudden, the tomb started to shake, 
And Jesus comes back into his body. And all of a sudden there was light from the shroud. And the shroud, and Jesus got up and he folded his clothes really nice because his mom taught him how to do laundry. And to fold them on the empty tomb and to put it there. And then Jesus kicked in the door and came out risen and just nailed the rope. There is none of that. All that's there is the women came to the tomb and the tomb was empty. If you're going to make up a myth, a myth you're going to make up the one that I just... You're going to have superhuman, superhero Jesus kicking out the stone, kind of power driving the Romans, right? You're going to have this magnificent, victorious thing. That is not in the Gospels. What is in the Gospels? Actually, just the historical evidence. The women got to the tomb, had no idea how even they were going to roll the stone to go do the anointings of the bodies that they would do for several days after the burial. And when they got there, the tomb is empty. There is no depiction of the resurrection in any of the gospel accounts, just the after effects. That's why our liturgy on the Easter Vigil is so important, because you get to be present for that moment. And so when I turn and I say, Alleluia, Christ is risen, and the lights come on and the bells, that's literally the moment of the resurrection that we get to experience spiritually. In and of itself, the tomb is not a direct proof of the resurrection. Because it's not a description of the resurrection. It's the wound in the earth. An empty tomb, the destruction of death. Nonetheless, the empty tomb was still an essential sign for recognizing the very fact of the resurrection. When John reaches the tomb, and it's empty, and he sees the linen cloth lying there, he saw and believed. By the way, that word believed in John is not like he fully believed but he first started to believe that something happened there. This suggests that he realized from the empty tomb's condition that the absence of Jesus' body could not have been a human doing and that Jesus had not simply returned to earthly life like Lazarus. The way they found the burial cloths, by the way. If you're going to steal a body, why leave the cloths? If you're going to steal the body and run and hide it somewhere else, why would you take the time to take the linen cloths and the wrappings off and then drag a bleeding, horrifically wounded, naked body out into the streets of Jerusalem. Why were the cloths there? Jesus didn't need them anymore. Remember in Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus? He says, untie him and let him go, right? Death had him and Christ commanded him to be free. Christ destroyed death and he was completely free from death. Those burial cloths couldn't hold him anymore. But the fact that they were folded nicely, I mean, think about it. If you're a grave robber and you steal a body, you're not going to take the time to not only take the wrappings off, but fold them really nice and just put them on the tomb. Like, I'm done with these. I don't need them. Two, the framework in the Easter events is the appearances of the risen Christ. We're going to talk about them as we get to the Easter octave, the many risen Christ uh, apparitions, appearances, to numerous people, and that changed their personality after their encounters, which testified to the historical reliability of the event. The third condition, and we talked about some of this today, is the condition of what Christ's risen body looked like. They were able to touch him. He was able to touch them. He was constantly eating with them. I love the fact that the risen Lord is constantly eating. You got any fish? You got any bread? My favorite line in the New Testament, and there's, I just saw a t-shirt, and I will buy it. It says the first Easter brunch. And it's actually that gospel reading where Jesus is on the, the, the apostles are like, he keeps appearing, he disappears, we have no idea. Can we just go back to Galilee and fish? And Peter's like, yes, please. So they all go back to Galilee. They get out of Jerusalem. They all go to fish. Uh, there's... They're not catching anything. And all of a sudden, this guy on the shore is like, hey, what you catching? And they're all like, nothing. And he's like, just cast over there. And they're like, whatever. And he's like, just do it. And they cast and get a whole large group of fish. And then Peter's like, oh, that must be Jesus. And Peter strips naked, which is hysterical, and then jumps into the water. And Jesus, this is my favorite line, is on the shoreline and says, come and have breakfast. Thus, the first Easter brunch. <laughs> Come and have breakfast. Jesus is constantly eating. We will talk about why. But he's constantly eating. 
He establishes a direct contact with his disciples. He is not a ghost or a phantasm. He has a physical property that is risen that's the same body that was crucified. It still bears the marks of the passion. Think about that. Jesus kept his wounds. Many early church fathers try to figure out why. You know, when we were talking about glorified body, we expect not to have wounds, but why? Jesus' wounds are signs of his love. You want to see how much I loved you? In heaven, that's what he'll show us, his signs. Even he did it today to Thomas, right? See my hands, see my feet that were pierced and crucified. Touch my side. I love how Father Matt talked about the ick factor of that today, right? And I love the car. He talked, remember, I love that Caravaggio painting that you have on your Paschal Vespers, where literally Jesus is grabbing Thomas's hand. And it's like, I am a real body. And by the way, he didn't talk about it, but if you look at Caravaggio's image on your Paschal Vespers sheets, if you look, Thomas is not even looking in the wound. Thomas is looking off, like, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> I know you count it. I'm literally putting my fingers in the Messiah. Okay, that's weird and gross, and that's a that's real body, and I have no idea how this is even happening. Right? That's what Caravaggio is trying to show. But I love that Jesus has his hand, is helping him through his unbelief, right? So what do we know about the resurrection of Jesus? His body is the same. It bears the marks of the passion, but it behaves now differently. It is glorified. It is no longer limited by time and space. It cannot die. He can be at the road to Emmaus. He can be in the upper room. He can be at the empty tomb with Mary Magdalene. He's all over the place, but yet he can eat. He can walk through walls. That would be kind of creepy. Could you imagine that? You're in a locked room and Jesus is like, whoop, right? No wonder why they all were like, what, I, what is happening, right? Some were rejoicing and some were doubting and some, you know, Probably had to change their vestments. I would probably too if the Lord walked in, right? So he's just coming right in the middle of all of that. His resurrection was not a return to earthly life like it was. His body is now filled with the Holy Spirit. So those three elements we talk about a lot during Eastertide. The empty tomb, the appearances of the risen Christ, and the condition of his humanity. How does this now relate to us? The meaning and saving significance of all of this. One, the resurrection puts a stamp of approval on all of Christ's works and teachings. If he rose from the dead, then everything that he told us is true and must be followed. Paul says in that Corinthians passage again, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. A.K.A., if Christ never rose from the dead, why are you here on a Sunday morning? You want to learn to be a good person? Join the Scouts. This whole Christianity thing is way different. It's about a change of life. The resurrection fulfills all of the prophecies of the Old Testament and all of Christ's promises in the New. That's why you hear in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed in accordance with the Scriptures. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God. Jesus told us before his passion in the Gospel of John, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Ego eimi, which was the name of God in the New Testament. And remember, after Thomas is asked to touch his side, and after that image in the Caravaggio painting, where he touches his side, the next words out of Thomas's mouth are, my Lord and my God. He, you know, poor Thomas, he gets that phrase, the doubting Thomas. But he's the first apostle to say that Jesus is God. He's the deepest theologian. And when you put your hand in the side of Jesus, you're going to know you're touching God. And so the resurrection proves Christ's divinity. And now that Christ has been raised, we are justified. We are saved by the passion, death, and resurrection. Paul tells us in Romans, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Christ's resurrection is the principal source of our future resurrection. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All. That's a whole nother class. <laughs> All. 
Paul doesn't say some or only the good people, but he says all shall be made alive. What's that going to be? Well, we'll do another a live class on that one, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother class. Christ, we will say a lot during um, Eastertide, is the first fruits. So two days after Passover was the Feast of First Fruits, meaning there was a ritual in the temple where they would get the first barley loaves and they would raise them and wave them in the temple as a sign of the first harvest of the upcoming harvest that would happen all summer and fall. When Paul says Christ is the first fruits, he is the first one to come out of, of death with a new resurrected bhakti. All of us will be a part of that at the end of time. Your resurrection. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe in the resurrection of the body, says the Apostles' Creed. You all will look like Jesus. I mean, you're not going to look just like Jesus. But we believe that our bodies will experience resurrection just as his. They will be the same. You will recognize each other. But they're going to do all kinds of cool stuff. And we won't have as big of temples of the Holy Spirit. And our hair will probably be all back and not gray. And no one will need Botox. Uh, but we will all be new and filled with the Holy in our body. Why? Because if our bodies do not know resurrection, then death still reigns. If our bodies just lie on the ground and we have this soulless existence, which is not what the church believes, then death still reigns. And so even in our bodies, death will be conquered, and you will have a resurrected body, which is what we come to encounter in the resurrection of Christ. Questions? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, going back to the elements. Yeah. Elements, um, I think I'm still a little bit confused about like, Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus' resurrection, and then it says, yeah, like Jesus did not simply return. Lazarus was a resuscitation, Jesus was a resurrection. Lazarus came back from the dead to his earthly body. And that poor guy had to die a second time. I would be so mad, right? I got to go through this again, right? <laughs> no, he was resuscitated from the dead. He was not resurrected. Jesus was resurrected because he, his body now experiences the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which we will do as well too. So Lazarus was resuscitated. Jesus rose from the dead. Good, 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 good. How do we participate in all this? And another theme you're going to hear all through Eastertide is baptism, which is why I soak everyone down, and Father Matt will now soak everyone down, and poor Deacon Colleen will have wet sleeves on her Dalmatic every Sunday as we hose everyone down with the waters of baptism. Because as Paul says, through the when we are buried with Christ in baptism, we rise with him. Baptism is our entrance into the resurrection, which is why Eastertide is really a baptismal season. This comes from Catherine Doherty. You know, that, the, the one that we talked about who ran um, the, the Madonna house. We talked about this in our Lent class. The Easter is the Passover of the Lord. That's another thing we will talk about. Passover, a lot. This is our Pascha, our Passover. The night our Lord rose from the dead. She's given a meditation on the Easter Vigil. It is the most important moment in the history of humankind and in the Christian liturgical year. From the earliest days of its existence, the church taught that the best way to make the faithful realize the Paschal mystery was baptize on that night those who have been preparing for baptism. Or to ask those of us already baptized to renew and revive our own baptism. For to be baptized is to truly die with Christ in order to resurrect with him. God led the Hebrews to cross the Red Sea that they might escape from their enemies and reach the Promised Land. The waters of the Red Sea became a tomb in which the Egyptian armies were buried, but they are also a womb which gives birth to a new and free people. The waters of baptism are figuratively the Red Sea which engulfs the forces of evil and liberates God's people. Baptism, the sacrament of hope, because I am baptized, I enter into the mystical body of Christ and could call Jesus my Savior and become an heir to the Father. Gathering all that happens through the baptismal waters as one would gather a sheaf of flowers, I hold in my hands hope. So you're going to hear how the two great sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist become the pillars that we ground ourselves 
around the risen Lord. That's why I love that the Paschal candle kind of stays there for Eastertide, because it really holds the risen Lord, which is what the candle symbolizes, holds for us baptism and Eucharist together, which is how we experience the resurrection. Okay, at your tables, I want you to get your hymnals out, and I want you to get out everyone's favorite Easter hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, hymn number 207. I want you to read through the lyrics, and let's look at some words or phrases that jump out to you, and that'll be the the catalyst for our um, conversation on the Easter octave. So take a look at those. Uh, We'll take like five minutes, and we'll go from there. So what phrases did you hear in that hymn? Hymns of praise. Sinners to redeem. There's that how we participate in the resurrection. Rachel? Suffered to redeem our loss. Loss of what? Loss of our relationship with God. Moving out of the garden. Loss of life, too. Risen today. It's not just for Easter Sunday, by the way. We can sing that hymn every day. Because Christ is risen every day. I love to have that sung at funerals. You know, this is our participation in it. You know, a lot of times we're like, oh, we only sing it on Easter Sunday. No, we sing it all the time. Our triumphant. Yeah, notice it's our triumphant. We join with Christ. This is how we share in his victory. Above the sky, he's king. Now, that's, that's a little different, right? Because above the sky means he's out of time and space. Right? He's no longer bound to the earthly realm. Doesn't mean that... You know, this whole kind of notion that God is up, you know, is kind of very ancient, you know, that over the waters is where heaven was. But really, up and out means it's no longer bound to time or space. That's what that actually means. Heavenly hosts. Praise him, all ye heavenly hosts. What is heavenly hosts, by the way? You hear that in the Holy Holy, too, sometimes, right? The angels. Hostia means armies. So the, the battling armies, the heavenly armies. Cherubim and seraphim. (laughs) Sing we. Yeah, together. We do this together. It's just not you and Jesus. It's you, Jesus, and everyone else around you. Everyone on the island of misfit toys. (laughs) Salvation procured. He did it for us. Yeah. That's why this is a triumphant song. Once upon the cross. So remember, we go back to... By the way, the cross... So I was thinking about this, too. There's a lot of Easter symbols around here. So obviously this is one, other than the Paschal candle, right? We have the risen cross. Anyone know what the white cloth is? We just think we put it up because, well, we wear white during Easter. So, hey, it looks good. It's the burial garments. It's the shroud. And so if you notice on Good Friday, when we do the lamentation service, I take that white cloth... We take the body of Jesus down. I wrap the body of Jesus in that cloth as we lay him in the tomb. And then the empty cloth is placed on the tomb. It's like Jesus saying, look what I did, right? I triumphed over the grave. I don't need these anymore. So they're kind of just thrown on the cross as a sign of victory. So that's called the risen cross, uh, that the white cloth. And it's just not about the color. You know, sometimes you'll see people put red up for palms, a red cloth for Palm Sunday or purple up. And I'm like, that's not the point, gang. This is the empty burial cloth of Jesus that he's no longer bound to. So that's a sign of Easter. Easter lilies also are a sign. They are trumpets announcing the glory of the resurrection, which is why we normally use Easter lilies during Easter. They clearly don't bloom until August, by the way, outside. But we have them in here as signs of resurrection because they look like trumpets that are announcing the the victory. Anything else from the hymn? Alleluia. Alleluia. We're going to talk about that as we get to the back. We're going to fly through this. (laughs) Put your seatbelts on. Uh, We're going to kind of uh, go through this. But I want to talk about the Easter octave. Octave comes from the word eight. Sometimes in the, if you notice on the bottom of this baptismal font, there are eight sides, all right, that go around. It's an octagon on the base of it. A lot of the early Christian fonts in their churches were octagon shape. 
the eighth day. Christ create, well, Christ did create, by the way, Christ did create, not just the Father. But creation was spun out in six days. And then on the seventh day was the Sabbath. Shabbat, rest. God and humanity were one and they were united on the seventh day. What's the eighth day? The eighth day is the completion of those seven days plus one, meaning the day of the new creation. Christ rose from the grave on the first day, but it really was the eighth day because the new creation now starts with his resurrection. And so the number eight has a lot of meanings for early Christians and for us now too. The eighth day points us to deeper mysteries. The eighth day points us to things eternal. And so we celebrate Easter as one long day over eight days. So the church kind of stops time. Every day during the Easter octave is Easter. That's why we literally call it Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, Easter Wednesday, Easter Thursday. Today is the octave of Easter is really its title because it's the eighth day. But we stop and the eighth day, all of those events. What saddens me is that I wish we had such zeal for the Easter octave as we do Holy Week. You know, during that Holy Week, boy, we're all here. We're all filled. We, we all love the suffering part. And then when it comes to the joy, like we should be busting out of our skin during the octave. You know, we're already like, hallelujah. You know, like we're already dropping off by day eight. Maybe it's because we need to wait to experience that in eternity. I don't know. But the octave of Easter is more triumphant than Holy Week. That's why I keep doing liturgies almost every day during the Easter octave. And people think in the clergy, I'm nuts. But I'm like, it's, it's like experiencing Lent, but not celebrating Easter. It's like we want to fast, but we don't want to shout. Or we want to have Advent, but we don't even want to have Christmas. You know, this is the glory part. It's the time for us to celebrate. I can take a day off after the octave. But the Easter octave is so awesome and so important. And if you come to any of the masses, it looks like Easter Sunday. We literally do all of the music, all of the fullness, as it was on Easter Sunday. Because the octave is that important. And if you notice as we go through these pages here, every day during the octave is a different account of the appearances of the risen Lord to various people. And there are different opening prayers for every one of those days. So let's look at Easter Monday really quick. And if you notice some of the themes that we talked about. Grand Almighty God that we who celebrate with awe the Paschal Feast. There's Passover. May be found worthy to obtain the everlasting joys at the end in the resurrection. The gospel reading that day is Jesus meeting Mary Magdalene. Just as we kind of had on Easter Sunday. It comes from Matthew. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Jesus met. Oh, wait, that sounds like Paschal Vespers. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Matthew. Jesus meets them and says, Greetings. <laughs> and they came and took hold of his feet and notice this, worshipped him. They worshipped him. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers who set out for Galilee. There they will see me. Alleluia. It's stuff we sing at morning prayer and evening prayer. It comes right from scripture. And then while they were going, some of the guard went into the city. And so we have this first account of what the, the guards did. And that's a whole other topic. We'll have to cover that at a different day because it's fun. But we have the appearance to Mary Magdalene and the other women on Easter Monday. Easter Tuesday. Yeah. Cool question. Mary, mother of Salome. Sometimes is Salome's Mary, the mother of James. It was probably the blessed mother's sister. Yeah, that's a whole other class too. Yeah, there's a lot of family members involved. We'll talk about that, but it could have been Mary's sister. By the way, if you haven't noticed, everyone was named either James, Joseph, or Mary. It's very Italian, right? Maria, Giuseppe, right? Okay. Let's look at Easter Tuesday. Oh God, by the glorious resurrection of your son Jesus, and here we are, destroy death, brought life and immortality to light. Grant that we who have been raised with him, how? In the waters of baptism? may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory, this bodily resurrection in the end. We have the other account from John that we read on Easter Sunday too. Mary Magdalene is weeping, and then you, we've read about this in the gospel. Here's the account once again of Mary. By the way, do not hold on to me. No le me tangere. You ever notice that when Jesus says to her, don't hold on to me? She still, it wasn't, Jesus wasn't yelling at her, by the way. 
But Mary was like, oh, you're back, so we can do all the normal things that we did before. And he's like, don't hold on to the old me, because we're on a brand new ball game right now. There's a new sheet of music we're about ready to sing. That's what he's talking about. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. It's a proof why women should be ordained priests and deacons and bishops. From that moment that Mary Magdalene met the resurrected Savior to the moment that she got to the apostles, she was the church. And she was the only one to know the fullness of the Paschal mystery. That not only Christ died and was buried, but now she's the only one who knew that Christ rose from the dead and was sent to preach it. She was the first preacher that was sent by Jesus to announce to the apostles. Easter Wednesday is always about the Eucharist. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread. How? Where? Well, we're going to tell you in the gospel. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all of his redeeming work. There's that redeeming work suffered on the cross, right? The gospel reading for Easter Wednesday is the gospel of Luke, the road to Emmaus story. So in the afternoon of the day of the resurrection, two disciples were headed to Emmaus. One of them, whose name was Clopas. You know who that was? Jesus' uncle. Clopas was St. Joseph's brother, according to early church history and tradition. So it's Uncle Clopas, <laughs> which is awesome. Who's the other disciple? Luke doesn't say. Why? Luke probably is the other disciple, which is why he knows the story so well. But I think also Luke leaves it ambiguous to make you the other disciple, which is kind of a whole different story. And I love it. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near them and started walking with them, and their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why? They were in their own stuff. Hey, uh, what are you all chatting about? They looked sad. Uh, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place in these days? What things, Uncle Clopas? Oh, the things about Jesus and Nazareth. And now notice this. Who was a prophet in mighty and deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and leaders handed him over to death and crucified him and... Boy, we had our hopes set on him. He thought we thought he was the Messiah, but then he went and got himself killed. And then, you know what? Now it's the third day, and some women of our group showed up this morning. They were there at the tomb. They didn't find his body. And they came back and told us they had seen a vision of angels, that he was alive. Some of those went to the tomb. Who were the two that went to the tomb? James, uh, John and Peter. They found the empty tomb. They didn't see him. And we just decided to book it out of there because things are getting weird. <laughs> oh, Uncle Clopas, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Hey, by the way, didn't I tell you how this was all going to go down? <laughs> but let me just start with Moses and the prophets and tell you about everything about me. They came near the village to which they were going. He was like going on ahead, but they said, hey, why don't you hang out with us? It's getting dark. So they went to stay with them. And then look at these words. While he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Why did he vanish from their sight? Where was he now? In the Eucharist. Because if you notice, right after they eat, were not our hearts burning within us, and they ran back to Jerusalem, and they found the twelve apostles, or the eleven, and they were like, hey, Uncle Clopas, did you know Jesus rose from the dead? And they're like, you stole our story. Like, he appeared to us, and how he made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Remember how Paul said, first he appeared to Cephas? And then to others, here it is here. Because if you notice, he appeared to Simon. And then who did he appear to? The two on the road to Emmaus. And then to the eleven. So it's all here. By the way, this gospel reading is literally the first mass. The first true mass. Now Jesus instituted the Eucharist on the Last Supper, but look how it runs. They were in a procession. They were in their own stuff in the world. Jesus then explains all of the scriptures the liturgy of the word. Then he sits at table. 
and he takes bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he vanishes because he now goes in his resurrected body into the bread. They received him, and then they go forth in procession and announce to the world that Christ is risen. It's literally the first Eucharist. The resurrection appearances all point now to the sacramental life of the church. And as I mentioned before on page 5, these are all the things that Jesus eats. He was known in the breaking of the bread. He, when he comes through the upper room later that evening, hey, you guys got anything to eat here? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in his presence on the shore of Galilee. Come have breakfast, verse 12. And they had fish and bread with him. The risen Lord is now present in the Holy Eucharist. As he told us in Matthew, I am with you always until the end of the age. We sing in that great hymn, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Alleluia, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Alleluia, he is near us. Faith believes nor questions how. Though the cloud from sight received him when the 40 days were o'er, shall our hearts forget his promise, I am with you evermore. And then the next verse is, Alleluia, bread of angels, bread of heaven. Here on earth our food, our stay. We may not experience the glorified physical presence of Christ, which the apostles and disciples did, which is now in heaven, but we do get to experience the presence of the risen and glorified Christ in the most holy Eucharist. When we receive holy Eucharist, Christ enters into our mortal bodies so that we in turn can enter into his mortal and glorified body. The Book of Common Prayer on page 316 says, For in these holy mysteries we are made one with Christ, and Christ with us, we are made one body in him and members of one another. Because of, for the sake of time, your homework is to read the beautiful treatise by St. Hilary of Poitiers on the Eucharist. We're going to kind of skip the rest, read that. I'm going to do some more preaching on the Eucharist and the resurrection as we go. But I've got to wrap this up in nine minutes, so. <laughs> Easter Thursday, once again. And this is the collect we actually have for today, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body, those who were baptized at Easter, may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. This is another account of him appearing to the apostles. Jesus stood and said, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Hey, why, why, why are you scared? Because you just walk through the room and it's locked. Look at my hands and feet. See, hey, it's me, gang. Touch and see. Ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. They showed him his hands and feet. And I love this line. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said, you got anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and he took it and ate it in his presence. And then what does he do? He explains everything in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And how he must suffer and to die. And you are witnesses of these things. Easter Friday. If you notice, the gospel passage is the one we talk about with the Easter brunch. And the Lord says, come and eat. Come have breakfast. Easter Saturday is another appearance by Mark to Mary Magdalene. Look how Mark talks about. After Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. We've talked about that. But when they heard that he was alive and was seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared to, from a, in another form to two of them. Here's the road to Emmaus group again. So they were walking in the country. They went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. He appeared to the eleven as they were sitting at table, and he yelled at them for their lack of faith, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had rose. And then he tells them, go out into the world and proclaim the good news to everyone. And then today, the octave day of Easter, it's called all kinds of names. Dominica in Albis, the Sunday in white. Because back in the day, all of those who were baptized at Easter wore their baptismal garment for eight days all over the city. And then today was the first day they would take them off. And so that's why it's called the Sunday in white. It's the octave day. As I mentioned before this morning, it's called Quasimodo Sunday. Uh, Quasimodo Gentile Infantes is the actual early introit, this early singing of the psalm, which actually comes from Peter, the first letter of St. Peter, as newborn babes about all those who were baptized. So Quasimodo actually is ringing a bell in, in Notre Dame, but the reason why his mom named him that is because the day he was born was the first words of the introit, Quasimodo, by the way. And we obviously have the, the Thomas story today, the Thomas story today. 
But notice how all of those different, the church presents us all those different resurrection accounts to look at and think about and to believe in during the octave. What are some customs and traditions that you could enter into all of Eastertide? Paschal Vespers, we kind of talked about that. That, as we celebrated today, is done every day during the octave. When I was in seminary, we did it every night, which is really kind of cool. You really kind of hear that every night. The Alleluia is restored that we gave up during Lent, that we fasted from, is now sung with joy. From the Easter vigil through the day of Pentecost, Alleluia, Alleluia may be added to any of the dismissals, not only for Mass, but morning prayer and evening prayer. Easter eggs are Christian. Easter eggs are Christian. According to tradition, after Jesus' ascension into heaven, Mary Magdalene, who was a wealthy woman of some importance, we know that Mary Magdalene paid for a lot of the ministry out of her own finances, by the way, boldly presented herself to Emperor Tiberius Caesar in Rome and proclaimed the resurrection of Christ with an egg in hand to illustrate her message, holding the egg, because she talked about how life comes forth from the tomb. Holding the egg out, of, out to him, he exclaimed for the first time what is now the universal Easter proclamation, Christ is risen, is what Mary Magdalene said. Really is what she would have said to the apostles too. That's why we say it a lot during Easter, Alleluia, Christ is risen. And the emperor mocking her said that Jesus had no more risen than the egg in her hand was red. And immediately the egg turned red as a sign from God to illustrate the truth of her message. The emperor then heeded her complaints about Pilate condemning an innocent man to death and had Pilate removed from Jerusalem under imperial displeasure. Whether all that's true or not, you will see icons of Mary Magdalene and she's holding a red egg in her hand in the Eastern tradition. And our Orthodox brothers and sisters on Easter always dye their eggs red. So if you ever, on Easter, sometimes the Nazi will start handing out red eggs. It's the blood of Christ that won us our salvation and life comes from it. So Easter eggs actually are a Christian tradition. And the Easter egg hunt is a Christian tradition. What do you mean? What do you mean grabbing eggs? Because Mary Magdalene came and was trying to find the place where Jesus was buried. And when she went to the tomb and there was no body, she kept asking where they buried him. Remember, she was asking the gardener, where have you laid him? Mary Magdalene is searching for the risen Lord. So an Easter egg hunt is actually, once again, Mary Magdalene, who then finds him and says, Christ is risen. So Easter eggs and Easter egg hunts are Christian. Easter baskets, believe it or not, are a Christian tradition. Baskets would be filled with everything people gave up for Lent. Butter, cheese, eggs, meat, bread, lambs. And then during Holy Saturday morning, the baskets would be brought to church and blessed. I was in a kind of a, my first deacon parish as a priest with St. Joseph's in Toronto. And there was a lot of Eastern uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Slovakian people in that parish. And I, for the first time, I was shocked that on Holy Saturday morning, there was a special service... And they all came with baskets filled with everything they gave up, with beautiful white cloths. And they would line the aisle of the church with the baskets. And there were lit candles. And there is ancient blessings in the old rites and in the Anglican church of blessing bread and lamb and milk and cheese and eggs and all of the stuff in the Easter baskets. And then they would take that home. And then after the vigil, they would just chow down. But that's a very, Easter baskets are an ancient, now we just fill them with chocolate bunnies. <laughs> that rabbit. Uh, but by the way, why the bunny? It's pagan, but the Easter bunny, bunnies are a sign of life, right? We always say multiply like rabbits, right? It's a sign of life, and the Romans always saw that as a sign of spring and life, which is how a bunny began to be hiding Easter eggs. So they took kind of a pagan symbol and a Christian symbol and melded them into one, which is kind of interesting. Also through Easter are the custom of greeting to Mary. We did that at the end of the um, Vespers tonight. Always shows the deep relationship with Mary, who suffered so much watching her son die and has announced that he is risen. And so it replaces the, uh, the um, uh, Angelus during morning prayer and evening prayer. Queen of heaven, rejoice. For you who did merit to bear has risen as he promised. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary. There's also the Easter blessing of homes. There's an ancient custom of having your house blessed during Easter. And it recounts how the Hebrews were saved by the blood on their doors. And now we are saved by the, our Passover lamb, Christ, which is slain, who saves us. And so the houses, there's traditional blessing of homes during Easter tide as well, too. So if you like your home blessed, 
you got a bunch of priests around, all saints, that can have a happy come bless your home for Easter. Wow, I did it. Yes, with one minute to spare. <laughs> Questions or anything about customs or anything during Easter tide? And I'm going to run around again so everyone can hear. It's one thing that has been bugging my mind. How did Jesus and Mary Magdalene, how did they meet? How did they meet? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, as you heard in the, in the passage there, we don't know what it was. We don't know how it was. Jesus casted out demons from her. We don't know what they were. Um, we do know that she was from Magdala, which is really fascinating. For those who went to the Holy Land, we got to go to Magdala. It's just south of Capernaum, not even a half a mile. You can walk to it. It literally was just discovered like four years ago. They had an idea of where it was, but a Roman Catholic group wanted to put a retreat center on the Sea of Galilee. And just like you do anything in the, in the Holy Land, they started to dig and they hit some old stuff. And so when that happens, the Israeli government comes in and archaeologists come in and they started to unearth and they found the whole city of Magdala. And one of the coolest things is they excavated the synagogue that is there and the actual floor of the synagogue. And so as our tour guide, he's like, Jesus literally walked on this, on this, because it's been buried for 2,000 years, and this is the floor, no one has touched it, this is first century, he literally would have walked and preached in this place, which was, is incredible. But the floor inscription, and there's like where they would have put the Torah scrolls, says Magdala on it, so they know uh, that they found actual Magdala. But it was a huge fishing port. In fact, there's a huge marketplace where they would have stored the fish, there's a lot of speculation that maybe her family owned a fishing company and everyone died and it was given to her, which is why she had a ton of money. Uh, but we know that scripture said that she and other women gave out of their coffers for the ministry of Jesus. And so Mary Magdalene was pretty wealthy, as you heard even in the traditional stories. She gets maligned as a prostitute. And that's because Pope Leo, I forget which one, combined the story of the woman who was caught in adultery with Mary Magdalene, uh, but there's no evidence whatsoever that she was. It's silly, and there are a lot of people think that there was kind of a lot of patriarchy happening because she was the one who got to see the resurrection first and was told by Jesus to go out and preach it. And so that's another reason why possibly she was maligned, but she was a strong, powerful woman. How her and Jesus met, Jesus, remember, ministered all through the Sea of Galilee area and was walking on and on that. And so I'm sure he came to Magdala, where he preached, and that's where they met. And something happened to her where there were demons cast out, whatever that means. And she had a massive conversion, and she left everything and followed him. She was healed of something, and we don't know. But she's everywhere. She was at the cross, she's at the empty tomb. And she's with them throughout the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Other questions, comments? We have 50 days to celebrate. Don't let the joy go out after today. The altar cloth will change from gold to white because the eight-day octave is now over, but we have seven Sundays of Easter to celebrate. So sing your alleluias. I love to decorate eggs throughout the whole 50 days. And guess what? They're all cheap right now and on sale. You get all those dye packets for like 50% off. And you can keep dying them through Easter and, and celebrate all of the different customs as we go. The Paschal candle will be lit for 40 days. As we know in Scripture, Jesus was present for 40 days, doing all of these appearances, teaching them. By the way, we just know the ones that are most meaningful. He was constantly appearing to them. John tells us he did many other things, but these are the stuff that you need to know to believe. A lot of the early church said he was teaching them about the sacraments. And what all of that meant in his life and all of that for 40 days. But at 40 days, he was ascended into heaven. Though the candle in the middle of the gospel reading on ascension will be snuffed out. So when it says he blessed them and was taken up, all of a sudden the candle and then the, the smoke just goes. And so the candle won't be lit again until we renew baptismal vows or we have um, baptisms or anything or funerals or things like that. But the candle will be with us for 40 days, but we celebrate for 50 so keep celebrating the joy of the risen Lord. And keep saying that refrain. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Have a good night, everyone. No level three class this month, just because my schedule got wonky, so we won't have a level three class. But it was supposed to be on the Ascension. I'll just do it as the sermon on the feast day of the Ascension. So come to that or watch that online. But no level three class. Make sure you're meeting with your level two class as well, though, too, your small groups. And then our final alive for this year is next month, May the 5th. We'll have a big Cinco de Mayo party and our last level alive for this calendar year. And then we pick back up in October. Cool? God bless you. Have a good night.